This podcast is brought to you by the ATMS, the Australian Traditional Medicine Society. FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining us on the line today is Amina Eastham Hillier. She's a naturopath, medical herbalist, and nutritionist, and owns a successful multimodality integrated clinic comprising 19 practitioners in Noosa, Queensland. With over 15 years of naturopathic clinical practice and 25 years of nutritional practice, she successfully treats chronic complex illnesses, including tick-borne disease, mold illnesses, fatigue, depression, hormonal imbalances, skin problems, allergies, and of course, digestive disorders. And she has also presented to medical doctors and naturopaths at a number of international conferences, medical documentaries, TV interviews, radio, seminars, webinars, podcasts, and workshops. Amina is the author of the book, Lyme Natural, encompassing naturopathic treatment for Lyme-like illness, co-infections, mould illness and stealth infections. Welcome to FX Medicine. Amina, how are you? Thank you, thank you. Yes, I'm very well. Thank you very much. Now, we're, we're going to be discussing Lyme-like illness and stealth infections, and it's, it's very controversial, this subject. I was extremely sceptical at the outset, but boy, this is... This has um, changed the landscape um, over the, oh, I think it was three years, four years um, since yes. I first sort of encountered it. But first of all, I just would like to backtrack a little bit. What led you to naturopathy and nutrition? Um, what was your heritage? Um, I started actually working with health and beauty, a beauty therapy diploma many years ago. And then I took it further and studied nutrition. So I, I worked with um, a lot of skin conditions and, and dermatology within nutrition and looking at the skin and just obviously realized that there was a lot more to it um, than just external. So just looking at the, um, loving the biochemistry and really getting interested in that, I decided to um, take it further. I was going to study medicine and then I found um, naturopathy courses in Australia whilst on holiday backpacking. So I decided to come over here and study, and that was uh, about 22 years ago I came over. We're going to be discussing various stealth infections, but inclusive in this is the term that we use, I think is incorrect, but Lyme disease. Um, now, Lyme is obviously a town outside Massachusetts in, in the US, but can you take us through what do we experience in Australia? And what indeed is the classic textbook description? And then what are we seeing nowadays? Okay, well, the classic textbook description of Lyme disease is a person gets bitten by a vector, which is mainly a, a tick, and will be um, infected by a Borrelia-type bacteria. So the Borrelia bacteria is um, one of the, actually about 100 different types of Borrelia. So your classic textbook would be Borrelia bacteria infecting the person and the person will maybe sort of like get some flu-like symptoms um, in the first couple of weeks. Sometimes the person may have an erythema type rash, which is like a bullseye rash, only actually happens in about 30% of cases. And so um, that's just classic sort of, yes, there's the Borrelia present. And in America, they often talk about Borrelia. Burgdeferia is the main type of Borrelia. In Europe, there's Borrelia acidulae and Borrelia guarinii. Um, now, there are many co-infections of Lyme disease, so I'll talk about those later. Um, some other bacterial infections such as Bartonella and Rickettsia and Helichia. However, in Australia, unfortunately, the current medical model, um, I guess, fails to sort of recognise the fact that we have Lyme disease in Australia. Um, so is it Lyme disease or is it a Lyme-like disease? Yeah. We certainly have something going on over here. There's, there's definitely a lot of people that are getting bitten by ticks. Over the years, there has definitely been some discoveries of certain types of Borrelia 
They may not be the Borrelia burgdorferi, which is your classic textbook um, species. However, there have been documented cases even just um, a couple of years ago in Perth, they were actually doing studies on Borrelia from echidnas. Mm. And a lot of um, echidnas have been infected with, um, they think maybe the Neomoti type Borrelia. However, medical people are sort of saying that those particular ticks wouldn't bite humans. So there you go. Yeah, but uh, to me, this refusal of acknowledgement initially that there was even Borrelia in Australia. And then once that was proven in echidnas, then the next step is obviously to say that, that it, it can't affect humans. Something's affecting humans. Well, the problem is that testing Borrelia in the blood is a very difficult and challenging and controversial um, area. The reasons are when a tick bites the person, the Borrelia so the tick sticks its hippostone, that's its pointy bit, into the person. And the Borrelia bacteria actually are harboring inside of the tick's belly. So it's when the tick is fully in feeding mode yeah. that the Borrelia are actually transported from the tick into the human. And what happens is the, the Borrelia tend to not want to stay in the blood. Like a lot of bacteria, as we know, thrive on iron. The Borrelia tend to um, move into the more um, collagenous joints, into the um, spinal fluid, can actually cross the blood-brain barrier. So Borrelia are actually very often not detected in the blood either. And at the same time, the antibodies aren't produced as quick as normally, like, for example, a virus or other types of bacteria. So the detection is really um, challenging and really difficult. And there are a lot of um, false negatives with testing. So it, they'll test for the Borrelia, it'll come up negative, And it's just because there's not enough of the Borrelia present and they just haven't picked it up. The Borrelia bacteria as well, they they actually, um, there's a spirochete form, which is like a spiral coil, and then it actually has a, a cell wall, but the bacteria have the ability to lose its cell wall. It's like taking its jacket off, and it actually becomes um, almost invisible to your, most of your antibiotics that obviously target the cell wall of the bacteria. Um, and also, um, they often be able to be undetected in blood results because of that. And another thing that the Borrelia can do is sort of form up together with another Borrelia and even just on their own and form a cyst. So they can actually form a cyst around themselves. So um, they're often going to hiding in that way. And then there's also the biofilms. they also a big um, type of bacteria that is quite prevalent in causing and, and creating biofilms, not just with other Borrelia, but with other bacteria, even candida and viruses. So... Um, they're very, they're they're pretty smart bacteria. They're very, um, very complex. They um, they have a, a lot of. Um, they're very virile. So when, um, like for example, golden staff um, has one or two plebs, and whereas what they're like detecting, they're like making the um, bacteria have a lot more DNA and a lot more. Um, genetic information available, hmm. whereas the Borrelia have up to 23 of these plebs. So it makes them a lot more of a complex bacteria. Oh, you said plebs. There's another name that they're termed by as well, isn't there? Yes, that's the tw uh, plasmids. They're often called plasmids. So um, this makes the bacteria so much more complex than the normal bacteria. So they, they you know, they have, it's a method of survival. Yeah. You know, they're able to go undetected. And that's the problem with testing um, is that there's not really enough um, accuracy. There are testing um, services available and in Australia that um, I believe are as accurate as can possibly be. It's just that, unfortunately, the government won't accept them as um, and give them enough credit to be a, an eligible laboratory. Yeah. So if we can't detect the organism itself in many cases, what about leftover signatures of infection. Can you take us through a little bit of the pathophysiology or the biochemistry that happens um, with Lyme-like disease? Sure. So, okay, so the Borrelia or, or some similar bacteria from the tick um, is 
an infection in the person, in the case of the person gets bitten by a tick, or other vectors. There could be some other vectors I can talk about later. And your normal immune response, the person would present um, the antigen-presenting cells as an immediate immune response, and that's where your B cells are triggered off and your antibodies normally, um, which then will further stimulate your naive T cells, and then that's when your um, your T regulation cells come in and they're wanting to try and help calm down the inflammation. But what happens is with this type of infection, um, your normal T1 helper cells, your T helper 1, your T helper 2, and your T helper 17 are often really um, increased and, and majorly active. So, for example, your T helper 1 um, inflammatory cells are just going to cause a lot of general inflammation. So you've got the rash, you've got the pain, you've got the, the redness of the area that's been infected initially. Um, and then the T helper 2 um, response, you've got all the cytokines there, your interleukin 4 or 5. Often interleukin 10 is quite prominent in the Lyme Borreliosis type infections. And there's going to be a lot of allergy type responses. So people become more sensitive to food, to chemicals, um, to noise sound. And there's the the T helper 17 cells and the whole um, cytokine response there, so interleukin 17 and um, interleukin 22, that are going to cause a lot more chronic inflammation. So a person will end up with chronic Lyme symptoms such as joint pain, um, chronic brain fog, anxiety, depression from inflammation in the brain, a lot of gut um, inflammation, and pretty much whatever the person is, genetically susceptible to, that person may very well then start um, experiencing um, symptoms of autoimmune diseases that they, you know, are gen genetically susceptible to. Previously, um, we would have thought, you know, two decades, three decades ago, we would have thought about candidiasis, chronic candidiasis. Um, we would also be considering things like fibromyalgia. How do you tease apart which it is? W what's different with acute borreliosis to other forms of disease? And indeed, what's different from the acute form to the chronic form? Okay, so your acute form is, for example, a person gets bitten by a tick, they may or may not experience the erythema migraine type, the bullseye rash, which yep. happens in 30% of cases. Um, they may get an acute um, infection, they may get a flu-like symptoms for a couple of weeks, they may have really bad headaches, um, neck pain, um, feverish, and they may just be feeling really, really exhausted. And they may just feel it's like a really, really bad flu. And then what happens is that may subside slightly, but the person never fully gets better. And then we go into, in a few months, it starts getting more of an inflammatory response. So we call it disseminated Lyme, where the symptoms will be more um, you know, a lot more fatigue, a lot more inflammation. So generally you'll be having uh, more joint pain, um, more rashes, more brain fog. And usually that's around sort of six months. And then anywhere from six months to two years um, is where you've got your more chronic Lyme symptoms, which basically these are the types of patients that I see and that many of the practitioners will actually see in their everyday clinic. And these are the patients that are chronic complex. They have chronic fatigue. They have um, focus memory, concentration problems. Brain fog is often described. Look, they often maybe have headaches, neck pain, depression, anxiety. And that can be a chemical depression, but also because there's, you know, a lot of, um, I guess, misdiagnosis and, and not being heard. And then um, joint, joint pain, muscle pain, shooting pains, nerve twitches, tremors. Sometimes people even get seizures. And there's often gut dysbiosis. Um, often people end up having more um, parasite infections, whether they had it before or whether the parasites have just been opportunistic and sort of, you know, expanded because of the inflammatory state of the person's yeah, gut. Yeah. So it ends up a full-on chronic condition with, Every single system of the body is affected, and and the big 
culprit or the, the trigger is inflammation. I'm wondering here if the best approach to treatment would be, you know, do you go in guns blazing with heavy-handed treatments or do you actually start with really gentle, nourishing sort of things that can improve resilience? How do you approach the, the treatment phase of this? Okay, well, with chronic Lyme, it's very different to acute Lyme. It's almost like treating two completely different um, diseases. So with acute Lyme, I would go in more stronger. And I, if someone has just been bitten by a tick or another vector like a spider or mosquitoes or they have the types of symptoms, I would um, definitely go in with the higher doses of your immune support herbs, you know, your vitamin Cs and, and any sort of immune supporting nutrients. And I even, depending on the case, may even suggest the person might go and get some antibiotics um, and work with there are a lot of doctors I work with, but work with the doctor um, with the herbal medicine, the nutrients and the antibiotics. That's for acute Lyme, so acute Borreliosis or some sort of acute um, tick-borne infection. When it comes to chronic, but certainly I wouldn't go straight in with high-dose antibacterial herbs or um, anything too stimulating. With chronic, I do the absolute opposite. I do actually start treating very gently. Um, first of all, I'll just use anti-inflammatory support only and nothing stimulating at all. And the reason why is purely out of experience. I've, I've gone in too heavy, too hard, um, and people end up having a Herxheimer reaction, which is your natural die-off reaction to any bacteria or candida. So when you start treating any sort of pathogen, um, if the treatment's a bit too strong um, and the person's not ready, as in they have too much inflammation going on or too much toxicity, they're not detoxing well, um, often there's a lot of genetic you know, MTHFR, those sorts of things going on. Um, so if the person isn't um, ready, the, the enough liver support, enough adrenal support and enough immune support, then the person's more likely going to experience um, n nasty side effects of the Herxheimer reaction. So therefore, um, I definitely go in very gently. So the anti-inflammatory support first, then I might, and I might use herbs, um, such as yeah, chamomile, calendula, marshmallow, um, celery, alkalizing, so very gentle. Mm. And then um, I would slowly build up the um, immune system with immune herbs. And I actually have had many patients that are so sensitive um, that they can't even handle any type of herb, even the most gentle herb like chamomile. So I've actually brought in a, a bit of a dropper dose technique that I use, and it's, it's brilliant. I love it. It works really well where I'll just use um, dropper doses just for those first couple of weeks, and you build the patient up, and it actually uh, massively um, desensitizes the patient so they're not as reactive, so they're able to take the herbs um, so that works really well yeah. with the sensitive patients. I'm with you there with regards to herbs. We were sort of entrenched in our training with regards to the appropriate dosage that would gain effect. But I, I note that um, one of the very few registered herbal medicines is drop dosages. Um, and that's for use in IBS. And, um, you know, I just think it's a, it's a big lesson we need to learn that it, we don't always require these heavy handed approaches. I've learned like you, that it's not always appropriate. What? Yeah, that's right. And it's, it's, it's really important because if you'd said to me, you know, 15 years ago, oh, someone's going to react to five drops of chamomile, I would have just thought that's ridiculous. That's that, you know, but I, I've seen it. I, you know, so I know, how sensitive patients are. Some patients can't even take the alcohol herbs at all. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, but they are able to eventually. We just increase the dose a little bit by bit and then introduce another herb. And then before you know it, within a few weeks, they have the basic anti-inflammatory herbs in a bottle. There's the formula. And then we can introduce other things. And the same with nutrients, even with vitamin C and, you know, gentle magnesium. So I'd start very, very low and then increase and, and keep the um, the protocol as simple as possible. And before you know it, we're able to go in with the higher doses. And when the patient's ready, when their inflammation has gone down, initially it's all about bringing the inflammation down. 
when their immune system's supported, when their nervous system's not as reactive, um, and their diet is also, you work on the diet as well, of course, then when the time's right, you're able to come in with a lot stronger antibiotic herbs, antibacterial, um, you know, your, your antiviral, your anti-candida, and, and then you've got a really good um, chance of actually busting the cyst and the biofilm safely and effectively because your body, the body's already ready. It's actually um, um, prepared for it. Are there any type of person, obviously, other than those within a tick infested area, any type of person that's going to be more prone to being affected by Borreliosis? Absolutely. Um, basically, many pa- people who, okay, so I, 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 in my book, I've got this a chronic um, cycle of all the different things that can actually, you need to look at when you're looking at any sort of chronic stealth infection, especially Lyme. And the first thing is, you know, people are going to have genetics that they are make them more susceptible to be um, prone to affected by infection. So, you, for example, I mentioned the MTHFR, um, your COMT, your CBS type genes, your CYP1A2, you know, your cytokine type genes. So, um, p- patients already that have a problem with detoxing, they're already going to be toxic. So, they're probably going to have a lot more heavy metals. They're probably going to have a lot more. Um, deficiencies of minerals so often they're deficient in zinc and magnesium and iron and molybdenum and all the selenium and all the important um, minerals that are necessary for detox and for immune support often their thyroid's slightly underactive or the opposite um, often the person already or has this gut dysbiosis um, and I know we all know lots about gut dysbiosis but when I being my patients, I always do a comprehensive stool analysis and every single patient that I see has some sort of gut dysbiosis. So, you know, they're lacking the the essential beneficial bacteria, the bifidobacterium, the lactobacillus. Often they have very high levels of E. coli or very low levels of E. coli, high streptococcus. I constantly see high levels of Klebsiella pneumoniae, um, the Cytorobacter, Enterobacter, the Proteus mirabilis type bacteria, so they're often in quite dysbiotic um, amounts. Often there's overriding um, yeast that's too um, prevalent. Often the patient has very low secretory IgA. Um, they could have high IgA, if secretory IgA, if it's an initial infection or they've got parasites or allergies, but eventually it'll end up very low. And there are often inflammatory markers in the gut. They're often more acidic, um, and I could just talk about the gut for years on end anyway, (laughs) but I'll move on, say, for example, adrenals are often depleted. So these types of patients are definitely more prone to infection. Now, whether they were in that state prior to becoming infected um, with Lyme-like Borreliosis or whether they... um, got the Borrelia infection, maybe struggled with it for years, didn't realise they had Borrelia in their system, and then things just got, you know, that that would be a piece of the jigsaw puzzle. So it's never just one thing. It's never just a tick bite. Um, There's always lots of other things. However, saying that, there are patients that have come to me that have said that they were perfectly healthy. They were, you know, maybe... Um, running companies and doing all sorts of busy things and marathon running and they were very fit and healthy um, but then they got bitten by a tick or they went for that bush walk and got sick afterwards and they never were the same since and so it can it can actually knock people down quite fast. Yeah this was something that it, it interests me and and what tweaked my interest was when you started to talk about things like the thyroid involvement, things like that. And ubiquitously, one of the issues with thyroid uh, dysfunction is stress, overwhelming stress, that the stress has now overwhelmed the resilience of the patient. So do you find that modulating stress and teaching resilience do you find that that alone or, or importantly can have um, a sort of major impact on their illness or do you find that it like it really has to be this immune support? 
No, no, definitely. It, it has to be all of these systems, definitely the immune support, but 100% the um, the bacterial, um, any sort of dysbiosis of bacteria is going to be affected by stress and then a stress will affect the bacterial. Right. It's creating a perfect environment. But absolutely, most of my patients, when I look back and I do their jigsaw puzzle of symptoms, um, there's always stress factors. So maybe they had a stressful childhood or they may have, when I talk about the person who was perfectly healthy, however, they were running a couple of companies or doing marathon running. I mean, that in itself is stress. Yeah. So without realizing it, people are stressing their bodies out and it creates a, an environment which is perfect for the bacteria. The t- these types of stealth bacteria that are from tick-borne infections are, that causing tick-borne infections are um, looking for the perfect environment and that's yeah. the body that's, that's stressed and lots of inflammation, and lots of toxicity and, you know, often nutrient deficient, like they just seem to thrive in those conditions because the immune system can't keep up. The immune system can't, and they don't have the minerals and the um, the resources to um, support them. Even what you mentioned before about um, Klebsiella pneumoniae, it's a commensal in many people, but um, you aspirate it, you've got a real issue. <laughs> so you, yeah, prov- you provide the and right I, environment yeah. and, and you'll get some bloody That's sputum right. coming up. So. And I see it in so many patients. And when often patients that might have, um, you know, chronic symptoms, like not everyone who comes to see me thinks they have Lyme, but they come, they get referred by a doctor or their naturopath because they have these chronic symptoms. They want to know what's going on. And often, you know, underlying um, bladder infections. And when we look at the stool analysis, there's all like things like the club CLA are, are really quite, you know, in the toxic amounts in that that red corner there. So um, there's, there's definitely a lot of other um, bacteria going on. And what about other stealth pathogens? What about things like viruses? It, um, and I guess I, I, always, I also need to ask here, when you're looking at these chronic stealth type complex illnesses, is Borrelia always one of the culprits or do you have uh, instances where it's other things but not Borrelia? Yeah, I, I, it's not always the culprit, no. Um, sometimes people come and they think they might have Lyme disease or Borreliosis, we should say. Um, and I'm not actually sure the symptoms that they're presenting aren't really um, giving me the picture that they have Borreliosis. So there certainly are different types of symptom pictures within the different types of co-infections. I, I think that yeah, I don't think that they all have Borrelia. Um, I think um, a lot of them do. Um, I think that Borrelia is actually a lot more prominent than we realise. I think that there probably are many, many humans walking around that have Borrelia in their system and wouldn't know it. Um, I've certainly had whole families tested and, for example, the wife might have the full-on symptoms of Lyme-like disease and yet her result is negative and then we test the husband and, you know, three of the children and two children have Borrelia and um, the father has it, but the father's not presenting any symptoms. So I, I do actually, and I've had that a number of times, I do actually believe that um, many people will be actually, will have the Borrelia bacteria present in their system. It doesn't necessarily have to go into full-on Lyme-like disease or Borreliosis. Mm. So it's a uh, an opportunistic type infection. Yeah, I think it can be. And I think because it can be passed on via utero, yeah. um, we know that. And some clinicians, including myself, um, can sort of um, think, well, I, I do think that it can be passed on sexually as well. Mm. What about working hand in hand with medicos? Do you find that that's always the best approach, or do you find that there are some patients who require medical intervention with the antibiotics and more severe symptoms, for instance, neurological impairment? Um, like I'd certainly be worried if somebody had headaches and they couldn't bend their head forward and things like that. I'd be really worried. Do you find there there are other people that have this more you know chronic type smouldering disease that are more appropriate for naturopathic intervention alone? Um, I think you have to really just assess each case individually. Um, I'm very happy to work with doctors. I do work with a lot of doctors. Um, I often encourage the patient to 
if they don't see a doctor to actually find a doctor just to get, you know, a general checkup. So like, for example, some patients may experience palpitations, tachycardia, uh, and this is very common in Borrelia type infections, um, and Babesia, which is a co-infection of Borrelia um, type infections. Um, so I, I think in that case, you know, you don't mess around when someone's getting heart chest pain and things like that. So I definitely will send them to a doctor, go and get an ECG, get your, I take chest, take their blood pressure anyway, but uh, maybe do a, even a 24 hour ECG just to also um, settle the mind of the patient so they're not so stressed. And then once they've had, you know, the ECG stress test um, and had all the basic blood, obviously check the homocysteine, those sorts of things, then you, you're safe to say, you know, you're probably okay so we can work on those palpitations with the right anxiety herbs and nutrients in that way and magnesium. Um, and for sure, there's other things that need to be checked out, like if someone has a, a full-on, um, I don't know, like say vaginal problems or something like that, where they, you know, there's, there's other things they might need to go and get other STD tests. They might need to go and get pap smears. Like there's certain things that naturopaths aren't going to do. Yeah. Um, and there's certain things where there's inflammation and swelling that people may need um, an MRI or they may need a scan or, you know, men might need their PSA checked. Um, so there's there's definitely a place for working with doctors, and I do encourage patients to just get the general test. I I like to see my patients' general chemistry tests, so the electrolytes, liver enzymes, full blood of cholesterol, um, the full blood count, the iron studies, and the thyroid. So if we can um, work with doctors, um, and you know I communicate right to the doctor, let us let them know what we're doing, and. Um, it's really good to get those tests. Otherwise, as naturopaths, we can test for all of those things, but then it does really add up. So I just get what I think is the most important basic thing. But even looking at the, you mentioned the viruses before, many, many patients have um, underlying viruses. So I'd say probably something like 95% of my chronic patients have Epstein-Barr virus or the antibodies. Um, lots of other different like herpes herpes 6, um, just general um, cytomegalovirus comes up a lot, Ross River fever comes up a lot, Barma forest, dengue fever. So there are definitely um, just as many viruses going on as the bacterial side of things. So sometimes it's good to go and send the patient to the doctor when they can actually go and just check for some of those antibodies and just see so you've got an idea of what you're dealing with. Yeah. One of the things I think that's confounding me, though, is you mentioned, like, for instance, if the, uh, if you tested a whole family, some of them are symptomatic, some of them are asymptomatic, but they still have Borrelia. So could mm. it be, therefore, that, you know, you've got to choose your who you treat? Um, for instance, Klebsiella is a, is a good point. Klebsiella is a commensal, but you, if you aspirate it, if it takes hold or if it gains entry where it can turn or be pathogenic, then you've got something that you need to treat. Otherwise, do you leave it alone? I'm a good old-fashioned naturopath in one way, although I like to look at all the latest technology. I'm always looking at the latest um, science studies and so forth. However, it comes down to we're naturopaths or natural practitioners, so treating the symptoms. I mean, it's it's treating the symptoms. How is the person feeling? Like if the person... Um, I had a very random person yesterday that I saw and it was a breath of fresh air because he actually didn't have any pain. There was no fatigue. His gut was moving regularly every day, a couple of times, form stalls, not really any problems. He'd, he'd had a rash that had gone now. So, you know, we put it down to diet and it was like everything was good. So it was like, well, okay, we could probably do with doing a detox for sure. But other than that, there wasn't really too much. It wasn't really needing to have any more functional medicine testing and it was just probably the healthiest person I've seen in months. <laughs> um, now, if, so you're treating the symptoms, but obviously if someone is in pain, you've got to work on the inflammation and, and look at any trigger that's going to be possibly causing that. So looking at things like your stool analysis is very helpful, your hair toxicity, your mineral levels, even looking at how well the liver's functioning, you know, your glutathione, your, your phase two detox testing, your leaky gut um, naturalose test can be helpful, SIBO. Depending on what the person's presenting is obviously what 
sort of um, functional medicine testing. If someone's very chronically in a lot of pain and it's a bit of a mystery, we'll often go down the um, the organic acid testing path, and that can give a lot of information about the inflammatory cycle, bacterial growth, and and the mitochondrial, the Krebs cycle um, chemicals that may be out of balance. So it's looking at the patient's symptoms and um, working on 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 the, on what's actually preventing, rather than trying. The thing is, you may never know all the different stealth infections. There's absolutely hundreds of them. You know, there's so many. Just with Lyme itself, if someone gets bitten by a tick, you know, you've got Bartonella, which causes a lot of pain, a lot of inflammation, a lot of neurological damage, um, a lot of joint pain. Um, and then you've got Babesia, which is a protozoa that's more like malaria, but that causes a lot of headaches and a lot of fevers. So, when I when I'm looking at treating patients, I give them a very um, comprehensive symptom diary, and they have to fill it out every week. And I'm looking at the cycles of the symptoms because often Borrelia type symptoms will flare up once a month, and could be co- coinciding with a woman's menstrual cycle. So it's often misunderstood as you know menstrual hormonal stuff. Um, Babesia tends to flare up every five to eight days. It's a lot more severe. Bartonella tends to flare up every two weeks. Um, blastocystis past parasites tend to flare up every 10 days. So, and often if they've got a few co infections, it can be very tricky and things overlap. But you can actually, patients will know what's going on and it's very interesting. They love doing the symptom diaries that I've put together because it's like a chart and it's got all the symptoms of two sides of A4, and then, then you sort of look at how often you're getting their symptom and um, and how severe it is. So looking at those cycles are really important. And are these charts in your book, That Lime Natural? They are actually on my website, which is oh, okay. uh, amina, www.amina.com.au. Great. We'll put that up on the FX Medicine so that people can access them. What about the connection with mold? This is something that's confounding me. And again, I was extremely sceptical at the beginning, but talking with these great minds like Nicole Bilsma, it's far worse than what we thought initially. But what's the connection here? Well, many people who have Lyme-like um, infections often are more susceptible to mold illness. So it's the it's the mycotoxins of mold. So it's the it's the toxins and the dead bits of the mold that sort of get floating in the air that actually can really affect people and they get into the bloodstream and then it's very hard for the body to eliminate mycotoxins if the detox pathways are challenged. So um, what there has actually been a lot of um, research into patients that are having very similar genetic patterns, so the HLA-DRDQ genotypes, there's about 54 of these different sort of haplotypes, but the HLA genotypes are, um, depending on um, what the person has, people are either more susceptible to celiac disease, Lyme borreliosis type infections or mold illness, but they have very similar, they can have a few similar um, numbers when you're testing the genes that actually come up. So it shows that they're more, you know, that person could be very prone to getting infected by Lyme-like or Borreliosis type infections, as well as very prone to mold illness. And as far as the mold illness genes go, I mean, it's 24% of people have the HLA genotypes for mold. So um, it, it's like pretty much one in four of a household. So you've got three people in a house that aren't affected by the mold at all, and that one person is going to be the person that gets the headaches and the brain fog and, and inflammation is one of the worst sort of um, triggers of mold illness and the my- mycotoxins. Is this a, a measurable difference, a measurable type of inflammation? Do you have to be measuring like um, CRP, ESR, or do you look at the interleukins that go around like my L6? You can look at the interleukins. So if you want, it depends. It really depends because there's many, many tests. So you can certainly do the cytokine testing, like Nutripath will do that. Oh, okay. Um, and often those um, the interleukins will show up, you know, if there's a lot of inflammation in that way. Um, you can do um, the, the C reactive protein and the ESR. Often they don't tend to come up unless there's acute 
infections or something. So often they can just be normal and, and the person still is, has got long-term systemic inflammation. Um, with the Lyme testing, you can actually do, um, you can do the, um, the mycotoxin type testing. So you can actually see what mycotoxins are present in the system. Um, and often they'll come up like the aflatoxins will come up and be quite prominent in pe people that have been um, exposed to aspergillus type mold. Um, and then you can also do certain inflammatory markers that uh, Dr. Schumacher in America has done a lot of work with mold illness and has found a number of inflammatory markers that aren't randomly normally tested, but actually come up in patients um, that are more prone to the inflammation. So things like your TGN, TGNF alpha, um, uh -huh. and your, um, your vascular endothelial growth factors. So they're different, they're inflammatory markers that wouldn't normally be tested. Your C4A and your C3A. Um, so they're like part of your complement immune system. So, and I have done a few of these tests before. I, I tend to, not go directly to them because I don't know. I've, I've not really seen many patterns myself, but they are um, randomly tested with some of the the mold sort of doctors in America. Yeah. Now you're doing some talks both for ATMS and I understand over in the UK. Is that correct? Tell yes. us a little bit yes. about these. What are you talking about? Yep. So for ATMS, I'm going to be doing a webinar on mold and mold illness and looking at these mycotoxins and how we can test the mycotoxins and mold in the house and treating it from a naturopath perspective um, or from a natural practitioner perspective. And then I'm going to be doing a two-part Lyme and Lyme-like and similar stealth sort of type tick-borne infection webinar um, after that. And in England, I'll be talking about similar topics at the next, it's the 154th um, British National Institute of Medicinal Herbs Conference in oh, yeah. Chester in October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, um, that's NIM. Yeah, and then I'm flying to Ireland. I'm going to speak, do a workshop for the Irish Herbalist Association. So, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to that because I've never been to Ireland either, so that's really good. Do you need a luggage so, handler? <laughs> yeah, a few people have said that. I'm actually doing a talk in Iceland as well for a Lyme group in Iceland and yeah. also in Sweden. So, yeah. Wow. So, now, what hmm. about further resources and education? I have a little sneaking suspicion that you've developed or are developing some uh, education resources yourself. Is that right? Absolutely. Well, I've got a, a master class that I'm putting together that I'm very excited about and um I'm going to be doing next year and and I'll probably do a few locations in Australia. And I'm also writing my second book, which is Chronic Stealth Infections, which is a lot more, it's like my first book, Lime Natural, but it's a lot more um, going into the viruses, the nutrigenomics, uh, more of the mitochondrial health and the mitochondrial therapies that's needed with these chronic type patients. And looking more into the sort of chemical sensitivities that these patients um, tend to suffer with, like things like histamines and your mast cells activation and patients that become very sensitive to oxalates and those sort of foods. So, yeah, so my book's, um, yeah, just going into more detail, things that often get missed when um, patients are getting treated. Of course, the proof of any treatment is in the pudding, and that's the resolution of the disease, or, or at least the symptoms. How do you that's find right. that? I mean, this is this is confounding this sort of issue. So, do you find that realistically we're dealing with something kind of like chronic fatigue, where they just have to manage it and soldier on at a significantly lower ebb, or do you get a full resolution, or it, or very near to? I think I I feel I do get very res good results. Um, not everyone, because there's always ones that sort of I guess fall off the wagon with treatment. Sure. And, but generally, my uh, mission is to get my patients where they're feeling so much better to feel as well as they possibly can do. So 
they may never be able to go back and do those marathons that they used to do or run those two companies that they did and, and you know, do that double degree. Um, however, my mission is to get patients to reduce their inflammation so that they're not in pain anymore, that they can actually focus, they can walk in the supermarket and remember what they need to buy or they can actually get up and leave the house in some cases. Yeah. Um, and it's a slow, I usually say chronic symptoms may take up to two years, but I like to get patients in what I call remission. So I don't know if we can ever cure, and I don't like that word at all, but um, when you've got stealth infections, it really is a case of getting the body in, in optimal health that it's able to deal with pathogens. Because we've got, naturally, we have so many pathogens naturally in our system. Yeah, that's right. You're not going to be completely antibacterial. You know, you can't just get rid of everything, of course. But to have people in remission is so that they're, they're feeling so much better. So they're able to go back and do what they want to do and they're able to function and have a normal life. Um, and the thing is, and I have had many many patients that are very you know happy they're actually able to do their normal thing or continue on with their life you know without getting worse um and the thing is they need to pace themselves though. Yeah. they will always need to pace themselves so um the adrenal support needs to be ongoing the herbal medicine support i do highly recommend um, and I recommend they still continue to take, you know, your basic multivitamin and your vitamin C and um, your liver support. And I always recommend that people have some sort of um, antipathogen like, you know, garlic or, you know, angiographic or something. But it needs to be cycled. It needs to be um, with a bit of a program so that, that we are able to always um, maintain that really healthy gut for example. Yeah. I'm heartened by the way that you treat the person, I mean, and not the pathology report. And obviously this is going to be a, a complex resolution, um, a long-term resolution that, you know, you're going to have to really concentrate on nourishing and, as you said, pacing um, to hopefully in the end improve their resilience. Thank you so much for taking Thanks, us through this. Right. This is this is such a complex issue and, you know, we certainly are not at the end of, it, of the days of the controversy. We are certainly at the beginning. It's, there's a lot more that needs to be cleared up. That's right. Thank you so much for joining us on FX Medicine today. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. The Polycystic Ovarian Syndrome Symposium will be held in Sydney on Sunday the 16th of September 2018. This ATMS special event will bring together five diversely qualified speakers offering new insights into diagnosis and treatment of PCOS. For more information and to book your tickets, please go to atms.com.au and click on the events tab. <laughs>